Hello. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today uh, for lecture one of the Language and Identity Workshop series. Before we give a word to our main uh, speaker, Professor Li Wei, who is uh, a director and uh, dean of the University College London Institute of Education, and also holds a chair in Applied Linguistics at University College London. I would like to say a couple of words about the flow of uh, today's event. My name is Maria Tsilegina. I'm a project assistant professor at Tokyo College, and I'm one of the organizers of the Language and Identity series. In this series, we discuss interaction, connection, and relationships between language and identity from various perspectives. Today's lecture by Professor Livet is on transpositioning and you take on translanguaging and identities. First, Professor Lee will give a lecture and then we will have time for questions and um, discussion. So dear viewers, please find the Q&A uh, button in the middle of your Zoom panel. If you have questions for Professor Lee, please write them in the Q&A section. We accept questions both in English and uh, Japanese. Also, please find the translation tab uh, in the menu if needed. Please note that recording this event is prohibited. And now to the main parts of our today's event. Professor Lee, please, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Maria. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, thank you again for the kind introduction. It's wonderful to be here with you uh, to have the opportunity to talk about something that I've been thinking about and working on in the last couple of years. And that is the idea and the concept of transpositioning. And I'm using it to uh, have a new take on translanguaging and identities, especially. Um, I know there is interpreting going on, so I'm going to try to speak fairly uh, slowly, although I have a lot to get through, and I want to leave uh, sufficient time for discussion uh, towards the end. So uh, do bear with me if I go too fast, but uh, or try to stop me if you can give an indication it is uh, a bit too much. So... Let me just begin with the context, why I felt the need for a new concept or new approach to identities. And I draw, I refer you to the uh, wonderful book and very influential uh, book by Bauman, actually published quite some time ago in 1999, um, describing a new era and we were entering a new era called, or he called, liquid modernity. And the characteristics of the liquid modernity are about the individual increasingly feeling, increasing feelings of uncertainty and the privatization of ambivalence. And this is really interesting uh, a way of describing uh, what he uh, termed as liquid modernity. It is a kind of chaotic, continuation of modernity, where a person can shift from one social position to another in a fluid manner. And this is why I'm uh, using the term transpositioning. It's really about the shifting, but also going beyond uh, one's uh, um, uh, physical-based uh, uh, or community-based uh, um, positions in a very fluid manner. And uh, Bauman uh, stated in his uh, book, nomadism becomes a general trait of the liquid modern person as they flow through their own life like a tourist. So what that tourist does is changing places, jobs, 
well, it's obviously a metaphor, uh, not not an actual tourist, but you know somebody who goes around uh, the world uh, to different places, changing places, changing jobs, changing spouses, values, and sometimes more, such as political or sexual orientation these days. Uh, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on self-identification, excluding themselves from the traditional networks of support. And that, again, is very important. And this is uh, being carried uh, on uh, while also freeing them from the restrictions or requirements of those networks. Those networks may impose, uh, as we know, social networks typically impose a norm uh, enforcement kind of uh, um, uh, a mechanism uh, or uh, ne uh, uh, networks act as norm, uh, behavioral norm enforcement mechanisms. So the liquid modern person actually is flowing uh, around and breaking themselves from these traditional uh, 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 networks um, and, and uh, really, uh, you know, responding to um, uh, different uh, conditions. Bauman stressed the new burden of responsibility that fluid modernism placed on the individual. So the individual in the, the, the uh, liquid modern individual basically has take on new uh, responsibilities. Traditional patterns would be replaced by self-chosen ones. As I mentioned, there is a lot of self-identification these days. Entry into the globalized society was open to uh, anyone with their own stance and the ability to fund it. In a similar way as the perception or the reception of uh, travelers at the old fashion uh, caravan uh, salarai. So this is uh, there's a picture of, uh, of 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 the old kind of inns, as it were. Um, the uh, result is a mindset with emphasis on shifting, not on staying, or the provisional uh, that is being emphasized, as opposed to the solid permanent commitment. And this is these are the characteristics of uh, uh, liquid modernity. A liquid modernity combines or uh, led to uh, um, or goes really uh, hand in hand uh, because liquid modernity is the condition and then uh, the phenomena we are observing these days is uh, uh, has been characterized by lots of scholars as post-humanism or post-human. So we're in the post-human society, and there are uh, discussions of post-humanist uh, uh, linguistics uh, as well. So in critical uh, theory, <clears throat> the post-human uh, post is a speculative being that represents or seeks to reconceive the human. Just remind ourselves that the human uh, or humanism uh, uh, is about the, the human nature being a universal state from which the human being emerges. And human nature is autonomous, rational, capable of free view, uh, will, and um, uni uh, un unified in itself as an apex of existence. Whereas the post human recognizes, or post humanism recognizes imperfectibility and disunity within oneself and understands the world through heterogeneous perspectives, very different, diverse perspectives. Very key to the post-human practice is the ability to fluidly change perspectives and manifest oneself through different identities. And that, again, is the connection between the so-called post-human practice and liquid modernity as a social condition and the characteristics of um, uh, liquid uh, modern or liquid uh, modernism, uh, liquid modernity, that is that fluidity. Uh, uh, in changing perspectives and changing identities and changing one's uh, uh, stance. The post-human philosophy or critical theory has an emergent ontology rather than a stable one. So the post-human is not a singular defined individual, uh, but uh, at least the, the, the um, emphasis is not on that, uh, but rather one who can become or embody 
different identities and understand the world from multiple heterogeneous perspectives. These are really important keywords becoming uh, embodying. So liquid modernity, um, um, my uh, colleague uh, and, and collaborator, uh, Margaret Hawkins or Maggie Hawkins of University of uh, Madison, Wisconsin, uh, whose work I'll be quoting in a minute. Uh, and I have been talking about uh, the liquid modernity as a trans era. And the trans era is really a transcending multiple coexistences to create new communicative spaces, both physical and virtual, each with their own ecological specificity, uh, specificities that shape meanings made within them. So we recognize the different kind of ecological systems and conditions, but the trans era which we uh, want to use to characterize uh, some of the uh, um, interesting uh, uh, phenomena in liquid modernity um, are about transcending, transcending these boundaries or multiple coexistence to create new spaces. Meaning making with increased rapidity, increased speed, complexity, and reach across greater diversities of peoples and places and through more expansive modes, not just one or two, but really expanding all the time, expansive modes and means. So in a late modernity as a trans era, one of the key characteristics is meaning making or communicative actions that we uh, um, uh, involve uh, ourselves in on a daily basis are much more rapid, much more complex, and much far, uh, uh, much more far, uh, re far reaching across greater diversities of peoples, different peoples and different places. And of course, we use different modes and means. So the trans era uh, uh, really uh, emphasizes or highlights the interweavings of communications, relations, identities, and belongings. And of course, uh, as uh, many of you here know, that I've been working on uh, with the concept of translanguaging, which refers to the multi, uh, multilingual language users drawing on uh, their unique personal, that, that is, and unitary semiotic repertoires. They don't have separate repertoires. They actually have a unitary uh, 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 repertoire that they can, they can use fluidly and seamlessly for communication. Translanguaging transcends, the, 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 the trans bit really means transcending rather than transfer or, or crossing over in between. Transcends not only political ideological boundaries of named languages, named languages we know are uh, 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 political ideological constructs, but also boundaries between linguistic and other semiotic means of communication, including different modalities. So even though uh, uh, the text may be in English in one language, I've got pictures, I've got colors, I've got so different size of fonts. All these are uh, different means, semiotic means for communication. And uh, of course, we're doing this through different modalities uh, as well, not just reading, but uh, obviously listening. So here are some uh, uh, examples of uh, uh, what uh, I would call translanguaging phenomena. These, um, I believe, uh, actually come from Japan. So uh, the um, a uh, character on the left uh, uh, refers to the, uh, very often these don't have any uh, standard pronunciation or anything, but it's meaning making, it's, it's, uh, it's a very good example of meaning making. So the, the character on the left uh, of the screen uh, uh, refers to Zoom meeting. So uh, there's, uh, there's uh, the um, uh, Latin alphabet Z, or English alphabet Z, uh, there uh, stands for Zoom, but of course it's uh, integrated into otherwise um, a kanji meaning meeting. 
And the one on the right, uh, as some of you uh, may know, is uh, distance, uh, social distancing uh, in seating plans. So these are really interesting creations that are tra transcends that transcend boundaries of uh, uh, languages or, or traditional ways, conventional ways of representing. And again, here's another one. Uh, uh, that is interesting, uh, even if you uh, don't know the uh, meaning of the uh, kanji or, or, or Chinese characters there, it doesn't really matter. What, what uh, I'm interested in here is the uh, English uh, part. Uh, it is actually read as it's time to play, but the word play is not written out, or it's not spelled out, but used as the play uh, uh, icon on the, uh, usually on the touch screen. And here's a, 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 a sign uh, from Singapore. It uh, looks like uh, uh, written in the four official languages of Singapore, uh, uh, English, Mandarin Chinese, um, uh, Basa Malay and Tamil, but actually they're quite, they, they mixed up and made up. Uh, uh, a monolingual in any of these languages would not be able to uh, um, uh, read it, uh, and they're not written in any kind of standard uh, um, uh, language uh, format, uh, but it's very typical of what is uh, uh, going on in everyday communication among Singaporeans. And another example that I've um, uh, analyzed and published uh, on, and I'm very, very interested in this phenomena, uh, is, a, is a Facebook, is, this is digitally mediated um, uh, uh, text uh, called Kongish Daily from Hong Kong. It's a, it, you can see it's a mixture of uh, um, um, varieties of English, uh, Cantonese, uh, um, uh, Mandarin, uh, Chinese characters, signs and symbols, pictures. Uh, in fact, you can play some of the video uh, clips uh, as well uh, online. And this kind of hybrid text is typical of translanguaging practices in this uh, uh, trans era and uh, uh, the liquid uh, modernity. And these are, the, especially the last example of Kongish Daily, as I say, it has videos and pictures and various other things there. Um, um, it, it is typical of transmodalities or transmodal practices. Translanguaging lends itself very naturally to the concept of transmodalities, which Maggie Hawkins works on uh, more than uh, I do. Uh, the latter enables robust social semiotic analysis of communications and interactions through the totality of signs, symbols, resources, modes, actors, and actants enmeshed in communicative networks and in college, oncologies, e ecologies um, within the sociocultural, historical, physical, ideological, and material contexts in which they occur. This is a, a, a fairly standard definition of uh, transmodalities. It's not multi-modalities. Uh, uh, as uh, you can see, uh, we don't use the multi, the, the multilingualism or multi-modalities is trans, is transcending the boundaries. Uh, um, and that's really, really important. And But also emphasizing the totality of this. Now, uh, uh, Hawkins uh, talked about the five complexities of transmodalities. I'm just going to go through this uh, 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 very quickly. You can actually uh, use this as um, uh, analytical uh, perspectives, say on the on the examples I've uh, shown you very quickly, you can really analyze this from these five perspectives. So modes are inter intertwined, gesture, posture, sound, color, smell, material objects, landscape, etc., entangled with one another to make the whole different than the to, to, to make the whole different than the addition of its continuous parts. So again, uh, you know, not emphasizing the addition or um, uh, additive side or the multiple uh, 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 laying of side by side, um, but actually transcending these boundaries, uh, interweaving. 
relationships between modes, language, and material objects, the locus of meaning and, uh, uh, and meaning making in the interaction between words, things, performativity, and spaces is something that is, uh, again, highly complex in transmodalities and something that we need to focus on in, in terms of analysis. And the third point uh, um, is the arc of communication, recognizing that meanings may be made despite the intentions of the sign maker. Messages are composed, travel, are received, or are interpreted and negotiated. So once something has been produced, it really is up to uh, uh, the receiver, as it were, to uh, uh, interpret and understand. This is all about inferencing rather than in picture, in pragmatic terms. Context and culture are very, very important. Co uh, communication occurs and must be analyzed within its uh, specific cultural context. And all of this uh, are connected to transnationalism and uh, relation of power. Again, you know, going back to uh, Bauman's characteristics of uh, uh, liquid uh, modernity, issues of dominance, subordination, oppression, and emancipa emancipation always underlie human interactions, but especially in transnational and transcultural course also includes translingual encounters. As people are transpositioning through flows, not that throw, through uh, 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 flows of uh, um, uh, activities, interactions, ideologies, and so on, communication must deconstruct and dismantle uh, hierarchical uh, um, uh, statuses and uh, power um, relations through critique, dialogue, and uh, reflection. So that those are really, I mean, you, you can read uh, uh, more details in uh, uh, Maggie Hawkins' article. Uh, these are really important points from an analytical perspective. They're not just uh, um, uh, conceptual, they're actually analytical as well. So we can apply these uh, to uh, the data, the examples I, I showed you. But very quickly, I can show you one uh, uh, example that I uh, observed in um, a city in Taiwan. I was there uh, uh, giving a lecture um, a little while ago before COVID. And one morning I, I, I saw a sign in this uh, uh, um, fruit shop. Uh, well, it's a little cafe. They sell uh, uh, fresh fruit in the morning uh, for breakfast. And um, for those of you who can read the kanji, uh, you will know this is this is a high, um, a, uh, well, highly um, uh, translingual uh, sign. Today's fruit. If I if I read it out in English, today's fruit is uh, watermelon. But the sign is uh, uh, composed of uh, Chinese characters because it's in Taiwan and the uh, Japanese possessive uh, um, uh, um, marker. No, uh, and English is. But uh, the key um, uh, noun, uh, an object, watermelon, is not spelled out, but uh, actually represented by a picture. Uh, but there is so much we can analyze from the five complexities, the perspectives that I just uh, shown you, uh, one of which is about the history, the social history and the co context. Uh, um, uh, and some of you may know that Taiwan uh, was a, 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 a Japanese colony. Uh, and had that colonial uh, connection with Taiwan, with, with Japan, uh, uh, hence uh, the um, uh, use of the um, Japanese uh, possessive marker there. And in fact, you can see quite a lot of Japanese signs still in, in public uh, 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 display. And of course, if you deep, uh, if you really, really, really want to dig deep, uh, and uh, analyze uh, the details. Uh, uh, there are uh, interesting connections linguistically between um, uh, the uh, uh, word uh, 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 which means fruit in, chi in Chinese, uh, and the um, 
um, uh, pronunciation of uh, uh, watermelon uh, and fruit in Japanese uh, as well. So it's actually highly complex. And uh, uh, a few days later, because the signs obviously uh, change every day in the shop, uh, I, I saw this sign, today's fruit is different, uh, and this is uh, cut uh, um, pineapple. It's not just whole pineapple, it's actually cut already for you. But the cut also, uh, I mean, the color, you know, should pay attention to the color as well, uh, coordinated. So the cut uh, also uh, um, uh, indexes the cut price, special price of the day. So uh, there's so much to analyze there from these five perspectives. Now, all of these uh, led me uh, to uh, the, the idea of transpositioning. As people are transpositioning, again, this is re repetition of uh, the quote from, uh, from Maggie's uh, paper, uh, uh, through uh, flows of activities, interactions, ideologies, and so on, communication must deconstruct and dismantle hierarchical status, statuses and uh, power relations through critique, dialogue, and reflection, and that is key to the idea of transpositioning. We are going beyond the old positions or positionings. We're deconstructing and dismantling these hierarchical uh, relations and positionings, and uh, uh, really uh, uh, critically reflect on our own uh, positions through uh, uh, activities and interactions. So, as you can uh, tell that this is built on uh, the idea of positioning. Positioning theories have been there for uh, a, a very long time. And there are many people, many scholars um, uh, working uh, with that um, concept. Uh, uh, I, I think it's it's going uh, somewhat out of fashion, but um, uh, certainly uh, it's a it's a standard um, a concept in uh, so in in uh, behavior theory. Uh, uh, so positioning theory, as uh, Hacking and, and David and Hale, um, uh, proposed, uh, are about. Uh, uh, the fact that people are able to understand phenomena and people only through the labels that we have in our own repertoire that we have acquired through our own sociocultural trajectories through time and space, which we ascribe to them by our own interpretations of their performances in interaction. So obviously we have our own positions, which we acquire through socialization and specific cultural context and trajectories, developmental trajectories, personal, uh, uh, to interpret these positions enable us to interpret other people's positioning in interaction or the meaning of what we observe. In all the interactions, we're making claims or bids for certain identities uh, through our uh, own performances and ascribing identities to others. So, so it's about subjectivity and identity and how we interpret these and present our own identities and subjectivities. So we ascribe uh, identities to others through our own understandings uh, of their performances using identity categories for these claims and interpretations that we have in our own repertoires, which may not be shared by all participate, uh, participating uh, uh, um, uh, participants, you know, members of the participating uh, uh, party, as it were, in a given context, in a given interaction, as seen in the uh, 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 previous uh, 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 chapter or the previous examples that, that we have uh, uh, seen. Now, interactions in, in, in this sense are uh, li fluid dance of identity. That is very much uh, Hawkins' um, idea. Um, researching English language and literacy development in schools, for example, uh, uh, as uh, as uh, she did, she reviewed a lot of uh, um, examples of this fluid dance of identities, and you can uh, read some of her uh, articles there, and, and the original uh, position, uh, positioning uh, theories. Now, this is further complicated by other factors that play as Hawkins claims. 
who uh, we are, how we make meaning in communication, how we see the world and understand ourselves and others in it are always emergent, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, liquid modernity is, uh, and the trans era emphasizes the emergent rather than the stable. The emergent process is co-constructed with others through social interactions that are situated or positioned in particular times and places between particular people and things and located in or shaped by particular histories, trajectories and movements of ideas, ideologies, resources, information, goals and people. I mean, I'm not going to read uh, uh, all of this, uh, and you certainly have it uh, in the text. That's a, that's a, a, a quote from uh, uh, Maggie's book. Transpositioning transcends a definition of positioning as constructed through exchanges in specific location-bound interactions, as well as its potential for being seen as somewhat static and its tendency to be analyzed by single categorizations uh, of identifications. Because uh, typical uh, positioning theory or pos the, the, the way we people tend to use positioning uh, uh, theory as an analytical perspective uh, for things uh, uh, tend to be uh, uh, based on uh, existing or single categories of uh, or categorization of identities, such as race, uh, gender, etc. Uh, to re uh, reference the full complexity, fluidity, and entanglements, uh, um, and contextualization of ever-shifting positions, I would absolutely want to highlight and emphasize the ever-shifting positioning, liberating us from notions such uh, of the space-bound, recognizing, but also transcending space and location. That is so important. Um, it's all about uh, the transcending. At the same time, it also transgresses external categories and boundaries. It also references the relational uh, nature of interactions and their fluidity, including the constant and ongoing assessment and confirmation. So we have to assess the, uh, and evaluate and critique uh, um, our understanding, our interpretation, and, and get com um, confirmation, reaffirmation, uh, and uh, a disconfirmation of the relations, uh, relations, the uh, constructions of new ones, and the shifts and flows as they change. All of this will offer new possibilities of ethical engagement with others from a more equity-focused perspective, not from the hierarchical uh, perspectives that I mentioned. Transpositioning is absolutely necessary. It's a necessity in liquid modernity. It's not just one of those byproducts. You absolutely need to be able to, you need to develop, all of us need to develop a, a capacity for transpositioning. It, we, we need that capacity or competence in liquid modernity because we can't stand still, we need to transcend, we need to change our positions, adapt our, our uh, interpretation all the time. Social conditions of transnational and transcultural post translingual movements, such as uh, uh, um, migration, you know, uh, and there are lots of people uh, here are transnational uh, uh, migrants, uh, and the encounters require an ability to transposition. It is a process where individuals break from their preset or prescribed roles and switch perspectives with others through communicative practices such as translanguaging and transmodalities, by releasing oneself from conventions and fostering a greater sense of possibility and freeing ourselves from habitual thinking and building empathy for others involved in the process. This is uh, uh, my definition of the process of uh, transpositioning. And it is also a, a capacity and competence that we uh, um, uh, really need to develop for uh, liquid uh, modernity. 
just a reminder of the features of uh, um, uh, liquid modernity. People really flow through their own life like a tourist changing places, jobs, spouses, values, and sometimes more such as political and sexual orientation, excluding themselves from traditional networks of uh, um, uh, support. And this is, again, you know, Bauman's uh, original idea, and it's really, really important to remind ourselves of these features. So in these conditions, transpositioning is something that we all have to have otherwise we will not be able to survive or succeed so i'm very uh, i'm going to i'm mindful of the uh, uh time in fact so i'm going to be uh, uh, uh giving you a couple of examples i hope i can manage uh rather rather uh, rather quickly one is um uh, uh, uh this um um, uh, case of the cans, I call them cans. Um, um, uh, it's it's a family uh, of uh, Korean ethnic origin uh, or heritage, uh, but they came from China. They're not. They are not. Um, uh, uh, immigrants from uh, uh, Korea to China, uh, but they are actually uh, um, uh, indigenous uh, uh, Koreans of Korean ethnicity in uh, China. Uh, uh, but they they currently live uh, or, or they have migrated to England uh, some time ago. And I've been um, following uh, them and some other uh, Korean families as part of our linguist and ethnography work. Now the Koreans. Are one of the largest um, indigenous ethnic minorities and officially recognized one in uh, um, China, mainly in the north uh, east of, of China. There, there are there are literally millions of Koreans. Uh, they they uh, do have con some of them at least have some connections with South Korea, typically. Uh, uh, um, but uh, it's a kind of historical. Um, uh, connection. Uh, a lot of them were migrants from China to Korea uh, back, uh, you know, centuries ago, and uh, then they kind of uh, uh, moved back. It's a long, complicated history. There are Korean uh, autonomous regions uh, in the north uh, eastern provinces of China, so you know they are basically uh, uh, largely Korean ethnic uh, uh, communities. The Koreans uh, uh, from China, they have a very strong sense of ethnic identity. Uh, in large cities, uh, there are clearly identifiable settlements. Uh, they have their distinctive food, dress, um, and they tend to uh, uh, marry uh, within the community. And also, they have a very good level of lang language maintenance. They're really, really uh, good at maintaining uh, Korean, including literacy. Uh, and they have a very high level of bilingualism, Chinese and Korean. These, uh, these are the Koreans in uh, um, uh, China. Now, this uh, the, the, the Kong's family, the, or the Kang's family, um, came uh, to Britain in their early 30s as professionals. Uh, they had a do they had a daughter with them who um, was born in China. They all uh, spoke uh, fluent Korean and, and uh, Chinese uh, and good English. And they lived and uh, worked in the northeast of England, where I was also. They all used mainly Korean with Chinese words in family uh, interaction, as they did in China. And it's very typical of Korean communities and families there. They, at that time, they had never been to Korea itself. They, they, they're from uh, uh, China. They're uh, uh, Chinese nationals, as they were, Chinese passport holders. Now, initially, their main concern was the daughter's uh, learning of English because she was quite young. She didn't know uh, a great deal of English and she needed to uh, start school in England. The daughter did not go to a Chinese complementary school. There are lots of Chinese uh, uh, schools in England uh, because she was born in China and spoke very good uh, Chinese already and uh, uh, had s some level of literacy, could read uh, uh, age appropriately, but, you know, not Great. What is interesting is what happened to uh, these migrant families is two and a half years uh, after they arrived in England, they had a, a, another child, a son. And that was a key decision making moment, you know, in terms of family language policy. Uh, the parents decided that their children should be bilingual 
but they use Korean at home as they always did, and they want the children to uh, learn English because, or to use English because they're now living in England. So what is happening to their Mandarin? And this is what interested uh, uh, me. They had children's books in Korean sent by their relatives in China. It's very interesting. And they had this play of Korean uh, uh, cultural symbols at home. Uh, uh, but as I say, they had no real connection to uh, uh, Korea itself. They did pay uh, uh, their first visit to South Korea as a holiday when the son was just over a year old. And again, this is another key moment. The first key moment was, uh, well, the first uh, original first key moment, obviously migration to England and then uh, uh, the birth of the son. And, and this trip to South Korea really was very, uh, um, uh, important because now they got a stronger sense um, uh, of uh, 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 Korean culture and also can make connections with other Koreans from Korea uh, in England. Yeah, because so far until that moment, they were Koreans from China. They're not they couldn't quite identify themselves with uh, uh, the Koreans. There are lots of Koreans in England. When the son was three, the family actually moved to the south of London, uh, very close to a very large Korean community, and again, a major decision-making uh, uh, process. So when we first interviewed them in uh, uh, Newcastle, they expressed a sense of loneliness because they're from China. They, uh, uh, they're they not uh, of the ethnic majority because they're Koreans, they're not Han Chinese. Their desire to maintain a distinctive uh, identity as Koreans and traditional practices, family interest interaction uh, led to the decision to continue to speak uh, um, uh, Korean, uh, but of course uh, this was uh, heightened by the birth of the son that they wanted to uh, speak Korean, and the grandparents in China also wanted them to uh, know uh, the, the grandchild to, to know Korean first, but because they were in uh, living in England, they uh, also had to uh, um, uh, learn and live uh, use English. Uh, so they begin to uh, uh, give up the, 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 the language that they, they would uh, find somewhat um, uh, um, useless or, or less useful is uh, uh, Chinese. So they couldn't quite see why they needed to maintain that particular language, even though they had grandparents still in China. But the grandparents, of course, speak Korean. So as long as Korean is there, it's okay. The trip to South Korea actually uh, was a turning point. It legitimized their claim to be Koreans. When they say, uh, when, when, when people ask who they are uh, or whatever, they can just say, we're Koreans. And in English, there's no difference. You, you, you can't, uh, I mean, you know, they're not, they're not uh, uh, pretending they're not Korean. Uh, well, they're not pretending they're not from any particular place, but the place no longer uh, is important. They're transcending that place-based or location-based kind of identity. They are just Koreans now living in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Britain, and they want to identify uh, um, uh, with other Koreans in in England as well, they don't. There is no particular need to specify they came from uh, China, or oh, one of uh, their uh, children was born in China. These details became uh, uh, less relevant. When we later uh, visited them in uh, uh, London, they interacted. We found that they interacted mostly. Uh, uh, with uh, um, uh, Koreans and, of course, other uh, people who are, uh, you know, uh, English speaking. And they uh, almost uh, um, exclusively uh, spoke Korean among themselves. There's hardly any uh, uh, Chinese spoken at all at home. Yeah, they obviously have a lot of English around. The son uh, simply does not understand Chinese and tell people he is Korean, which is absolutely correct. Uh, and the daughter still understands some Chinese, but does not speak it uh, anymore. So these, I mean, th this is uh, something that the uh, uh, children uh, uh, produce. And it's very, I mean, you know, visually 
uh, from a multi modality perspective, this is visually very Korean. I don't know whether you agree the color uh, scheme, you know, to lots of people uh, we asked to say, oh, that's, you know, a kind of Korean uh, uh, color uh, combination. So there is something really interesting there. Um, I won't uh, go for, uh, into further details of, of this. In fact, they uh, later on uh, uh, changed to British uh, uh, passports uh, and they just uh, become uh, Koreans in Britain. In effect, uh, cutting off their uh, ties uh, uh, with China, although they they clearly are uh, 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 still there. So this is uh, I'm using this as an example of a typical over time transpositioning process. Yeah, and the conditions, of course, this late modern uh, era global migration, but individuals have very different uh, trajectories uh, uh, and certainly not uh, uh, everybody uh, uh, comes from the same uh, background or living in the same condition. So for this particular family, the idea that they now want to ident identify uh, themselves as Koreans in Britain is absolutely very uh, um, appropriate for uh, their uh, own identity. But this is, you know, also a, a, an outcome of transpositioning, uh, reaffirming uh, their kind of uh, ethnic uh, uh, heritage, but responding to the new uh, conditions and the local sociocultural conditions they find themselves. And uh, uh, of course, they now do. Uh, go back and forward to China, uh, but uh, uh, they are very much, especially the children, identify themselves as uh, uh, Koreans in Britain. Uh, another uh, example uh, I really don't have time to uh, to go into is about, about spatial uh, uh, management in, in English medium instruction classes where the teacher uh, uh, move physically, this is transpositioning in a physical sense, from uh, in front of the class to uh, uh, the student's group and picking up uh, what the students are actually doing and learn from it. Um, again, I'm not going to go through the transcripts, you can share this uh, later on through the um, uh, um, uh, 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 reading, if you like. This is from my uh, former uh, PhD students, Kevin Tai. This is all uh, 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 published, in fact. Um, so um, uh, really looking uh, at uh, uh, how the uh, uh, teacher then understand what the uh, students are doing and learn from the students. It's a co-learning process that I've been talking about in my publications and talks. And again, transposition will change his, the teacher's position on uh, what she, he was teaching and uh, his understanding of the use of uh, uh, calculators, uh, formula and you know, other equipments in, in, in the learning process. So uh, in this classroom context, as I mentioned, this co-learning changes the role sets of teacher and learner from dispensers and receptacles, uh, receptacles of knowledge to join sojourners uh, on the quest of knowledge, understanding and wisdom, and teacher would become a learning facilitator uh, a, a, a scaffolder and a critical reflector, a reflection uh, enhancer, while the learners then become really empowered explorers and meaning makers and responsible knowledge constructors. This is all from Brandmeier, Edward Brandmeier's uh, uh, work, uh, who really uh, uh, inspired, uh, inspired my uh, uh, thinking uh, uh, on this. And the, the, the whole learning journey, as it were, is a journey of transpositioning as well. And again, I'm not going to go into uh, the details of this particular example because I don't, don't have the time. Um, I want to conclude uh, very quickly on uh, some methodological challenges. Um, when our primary interest shifts, analytical interest that is, uh, to a lived ex to the lived experiences of transnational multilingual individuals, in liquid modernity, where everything uh, is in flux. 
we need a paradigm shift, as I called some time ago, away from the frequency and regularity oriented pattern seeking approaches to a focus on spontaneous, impromptu, and momentary actions and performances of individual. This is typical of liquid modernity. Yeah, because lots of things are, are, are changing very, very rapidly and in a very complex way. So we need a paradigm shift of analytical focus to these spontaneous, impromptu, momentary actions and performances. So that's why I uh, 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 propose this uh, uh, so-called uh, moment analysis. That's the uh, reference of the original article. There is nothing wrong, of course, in seeking patterns, but behavioral patterns are long-term consequences or outcomes of original momentary actions, which become recognized, adapted, and repeated by the same or other individuals. So we have to, we have to understand the patterns are just outcomes of these momentary actions. You, you, if you have a series of momentary actions in the same kind of way, and they are recognized and adapted and repeated by the same and other people, then you become, it, it becomes a, um, a pattern. And the moment analysis then focuses on spontaneous creativity bilinguals show through combining elements of different named languages from uh, uh, different uh, semiotic systems cr to create novel expressions. This is typical of translanguaging and transmodalities. So that's why you know we need to really think uh, how to uh, analyze uh, liquid modern translingual and transmodal uh, phenomena uh, uh, away from what well, clearly the uh, traditional analytical approach is looking at patterns, counting frequency, looking at uh, regularity is not going to lead us uh, anywhere. So again, just a few words about the uh, uh, moment analysis. A moment in moment analysis is identifiable in two key uh, ways. First, it is mundane, it's just ordinary, but noticeable by both the participants uh, uh, of uh, interaction. So it is really uh, uh, important that it is not something that is, uh, you know, uh, uh, all sudden, suddenly becoming very, very, very important, or, uh, or you, you kind of announce it in advance, but it's meaningful. Uh, 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 are noticeable by the particip participants as well as by the um, uh, analyst. It's mundane in the sense that it occurs quite naturally. Yeah, somebody said something that you haven't uh, heard before. It's not that kind of critical incidents uh, approach, but uh, it's worth analyzing because it has been noticed by. Uh, uh, the participants, as I say, somebody said something interesting in in a very novel way. So mm, that's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, or you you notice this uh, 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 sign online. Ooh, that's interesting. I've not noticed it before, uh, but you notice it now as as something novel, as something creative. Creative moment is often commented on directly or indirectly or immediately after by the participants and you know uh, th and that's that's one of the key uh, uh, ways of identifying the moment and then the analyst has a secondary uh, um, notice and their job is to make sense of the participants trying to make sense of their own world in that kind of interpretative phenomenological analysis uh, uh, way and the second a uh, feature of a moment in moment analysis is the noticeability of moment means that a moment worth analyzing has procedural consequentiality, a concept very typically associated with CA or conversation analysis. The analyst is concerned with if uh, 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 and how the context uh, uh, or the setting of interaction has any consequences for the shape, form, trajectory, content, and character of the interaction that the parties conduct. So once you set something and it's noticed, then your subsequent actions, the subsequent actions of all parties involved in 
interaction will be influenced by it, by that uh, noticeability of the action. So, uh, you know, that has procedural consequentialities that, that's important. Okay, I know there's been uh, um, a very fast kind of uh, um, uh, going through this. Um, just a quick summary and conclusion, 21st century characteristics, that's where we started uh, um, this talk with. Rapid, constant changes, multiple ownership, multiple identities, and in, indeed fluid, fluidity is, is the key that we're emphasizing. So to survive and to succeed in liquid modernity, in the liquid modern society, an ability to transposition or ability for transpositioning is absolutely key, is essential, is integral. Yeah, it's key to survival and success. We know that our communication in the 21st century in liquid modernity is translingual and transmodal. Um, as human communication has always been, I must say, but in the 21st century in liquid modernity, it, it's been heightened, that, that translingual and transmodal dimension of human communication has been heightened by the uh, um, uh, constant changes of relationships. So to analyze these phenomena we, uh, and, and to understand transpositioning more fully, we need new methodological frameworks that actually focus on the liquidity and fluidity of human relations and identities. We really need a new analytical perspective. Beyond just a concept of transpositioning, I'm selling that concept, I'm promoting that, absolutely. But it's really also important to think, what are the new methodological frameworks that enable us to analyze, to understand the process of transpositioning uh, uh, fully? The importance of focusing on moments, to me, the importance of focusing on moments in everyday communication has to be the key to understanding uh, transpositioning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lee, for your amazing presentation. We are a little bit uh, pushed by time, but I think we have uh, uh, time for just a couple of questions. And uh, while questions and Q&A are coming up, I have one question. Yes. Uh, um, um, we've seen uh, through your presentation, we've seen how the situation currently changed from it was before. But I was wondering, um, what, what is your prognosis globally uh, from what we see now, globally, what kind of changes to linguistic identity do you envision by, say, the year 2050? <laughs> well, I, I, I really am not a futurist, uh, so I can't really forecast that. But I mean, it, 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 it's, it's clear uh, even in the, in the current uh, context that uh, uh, changes are, well, changes have always happened uh, throughout human history, but it's the speed and complexity of the changes. So changes are happening all the time, very, very fast but also highly complex. We, we can also say, you know, uh, hu uh, human communication has always been translingual and always been transmodal. I mean, young uh, babies start with nonverbal communication, but through gesture and face, uh, facial expression. And uh, throughout history, it's always been uh, like that. And human uh, languages uh, uh, start with gestures and icons and, and, and signs. Uh, um, uh, but again, it's the complexity, it's the five complexities uh, that Maggie Hawkins emphasized uh, that really characterize uh, um, uh, modern society now. And I think it will be even more, uh, you know, we talk about uh, the postmodern, you know, the, 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 the kind of... So such close and complex interactions between between human and environment, uh, um, uh, you know, artificial intelligence enabled uh, kind of technologies and all the rest of it uh, uh, has been intensified. And that's going to be the future. Uh, and uh, that's something that we need to keep an eye on. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm looking at uh, the questions uh, in the Q&A. And um, I think um, as we are almost out of time, um, let me pick um, a question more connected with your data. So there is a question from uh, Esther uh, Jans, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. I have a question concerning the cans. Do you think um, the move to Britain provided the possibility to, um, in the brackets, finally question mark, shift the identity uh, ties, or was it more a need to do so due to the new context? Uh, 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 these, uh, that's a really good question. No, the, these are. Uh, uh, it's, it always has to be a mixture. There's no, no single. Uh, um, uh, a reason uh, uh, for uh, any any of these things. I think that's something that you know must emphasize again. It's probably part of the complexity of uh, modern uh, uh, social life. So uh, clearly, um, there are critical or key. Uh, moments, if you like, um, uh, that are impactful, life changing, uh, uh, including migration. But clearly, the social conditions, I mean, had they uh, uh, moved from China to South London, where there is uh, a large current community to begin with, probably uh, uh, would have led to a somewhat different uh, position. Or had they uh, moved to a country where there's not a uh, significant Korean community at all, uh, and predominantly people from China, it could have led to a different uh, uh, position uh, 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 as well. So you, you can't predict uh, uh, these, and these are all, always responses to social conditions, and they are high, highly complex. They all intervene uh, into women uh, together. But that's a really terrific, insightful question. Yes, thank you very much for your answer. And uh, I'm afraid we are over time already yeah i'm so sorry about that um but um, no, no no it was uh, it, yeah. it was it was a very exciting educational uh lecture and um i would like to thank you so much for for your time and uh, i'm also grateful to tokyo college for giving us an opportunity to have this kind of discussion and to all of my colleagues who helped to organize it and of course, it wouldn't be as exciting and as educational without uh, the participation of our viewers. Thank you very much all for your questions. And I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them. And uh, of course, special thanks go to our interpreters for helping us to understand each other. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, goodbye. <laughs>